Uh, Yamnindra Hajran, uh, Glenn Barry is my name. I'd like to acknowledge the official custodians and of the lands on which we all gather from whichever part of the Australia or the end of the world that you might find yourself. Pay respects to our elders who are really set up a legacy for us to live, learn and love. Um, the, the elders that are with us today to share um, how to move forward in the 21st century and the future elders that are yet to come. And our own ancestral looking forward, looking back uh, as us being elders of the information, of the knowledge, of the wisdom that we're learning now and what we are going to leave as legacies going forward. Uh, we say, you know, Ningu Mauni, I want to know and Lee. Our ancestors are always watching. And on that note, I'd like to introduce a deadly um, wise one, Naomi Sunderland, um, to take us through researching, um, what do we call this again? Researching through art, research as, as healing. Take it away. Thanks, Uncle Glenn. And thanks, everyone, and a big warm welcome into this space. It's great to be here, and sorry um, if any of you had registered for the in-person event that I unfortunately had to cancel. I was so sick, haven't been that sick in years, but so glad we could be here to reschedule in, in, in the online space because it means that a few more of us can join from different places. Um, so really, really warm welcome. Please, everyone, make yourselves comfortable, and for those of you driving, please be safe. Um, we have got a 90 minute session scheduled because we wanted to make time at the end to, to yarn up about these topics. So um, that's why we've, we've got that little bit extra time. And what I'm hoping to do today is share some knowledge in a presentation. It's about this approach, research as healing, which has kind of come out of a few different experiences and a few different projects. Um, it's really started to crystallize over the last three years. Um, and it's really trying to express and I guess theorize and conceptualize and share something that an approach to research that has emerged through practice. Um, so this is one of, one of our first times putting this stuff into words. So we're really keen to talk with everyone here about it at the end of the presentation. I'm going to be trying to get through a fair bit of content in a fairly short amount of time. So I just ask that if you have comments, thoughts, feelings, things you want to capture, doodles, if you're writing poems, anything's welcome in the chat as we go. And deadly uncle Glenn Barry will be monitoring the chat for us. Um, but unless there's an emergency, I won't um, go into the chat. I'll just keep in the flow of telling the stories about the topic. And then at the end, we'll open it up um, into some breakout rooms. So hopefully everyone can share and then we'll come back to the big room. So um, yeah, as, as we always do um, in the Remedy Project, which is one of the major projects I've been working on, we, have, we had a policy from really early in this project, no talk without music. So as part of um, my acknowledgement of country and my invitation to all of you into the space today, um, I'm just going to share a song from one of my absolute all-time favourite artists, Yurimul. And I love this song in particular because it's got that beautiful connection to country and you can almost smell the salt water in this song and you can hear the islands coming down and that beautiful connection from the top, the very north of this continent up into the Torres Strait, up into the Melanesian Islands and to Vanuatu. And that's one of the reasons I love this. But it's also, it just feels like a beautiful, cooling song to me. It, it brings the energy of the water. So I invite you to just do whatever you want to do. Have your camera on or off. Um, we, like, we feel free to have them on or off as we go. If we're having bandwidth issues, I just ask people to make sure their cameras and mics are off. Um, and mics are off unless we want to talk. But yeah, I invite you to move. Um, don't feel like you have to sit still during this session either. So move, um, close your eyes, lay down, um, dance, whatever you feel you'd like to do. We're just going to have some music now with Yurimul and it's part of our, our connecting down to country wherever we are. So thank you. Here we go.
Um, thanks everyone for taking that time to listen to some music wherever we are. Um, so yeah, um, I just like to, as part of acknowledging, as we start this presentation, acknowledge all of the people involved in all of the projects that I'm going to be sharing about today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge all the elders in particular who are either part of that those projects or who advised on those projects um, or participated in the projects. Your knowledge is invaluable and you'll probably see it popping up um, up and down as we go through the presentation today. 
I acknowledge Yagar and Durable country where I'm joining from here today. And I acknowledge my own ancestors, the Wiradjuri First Nations people, and a big mixture of European ancestors as well. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. We'll move forward now. So to start the presentation today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I and we um, ended up settling into this topic or way of doing research as healing. Um, I'm then going to tell you a bit more about some, some sort of paradigms that support this kind of research and what we mean by research as healing and then tell some stories and examples from the Remedy Project in particular. And that's an Australian Research Council funded project. It's three years. We're in the last eight months or so of the project. Um, and we're looking at First Nations music as a determinant of health. And some of the members of the Remedy Project team and advisory group are in the call today. So um, it's a story that some people that I work with haven't heard before, but um, I actually, when I was, you know, very first starting in universities, I wanted to be a lawyer and then I wanted to be a journalist. Um, I specifically wanted to wear the outfits that the women wore on LA Law, if anyone remembers that show. I had visions of strange things. Um, so I started out in a business communication degree and I quickly found that it wasn't a great alignment Um for me personally, and I started doing these electives in these topics um, out at Castledine campus in Brisbane in, in an area they called transformative ethics. And they, there was these incredible academics out there. And I, when I think of them, I, I think of them as old school academics. And by that, I mean academics um, who would do slow scholarship and spend time thinking and talking with other people. And we did topics like human identity and change. And, and they were running a program where they um, did applied ethics and human rights work as a very practical thing. They called it a social practice. They said that ethics is a social practice. It's something we do and breathe life into in our every day. And they would dump um, this is people like David Massey and Peter Isaacs in particular, and later people like Professor Jane Clapton, who worked at Griffith for a long time. Um, and they would talk about a practice like research as a moral practice. So something that is aimed toward an overall good in society, um, positive change. And when they when they talked about transformative ethics within any practice, so any professional practice, any, you know, area of focused activity that is seeking to make the world and, and the environment a better place. Um, they would talk about this transformative ethics and ethics wasn't the code of ethics that sat on the, you know, the bookshelf or, you know, that was used to mitigate risk in universities and, and other places. It was fundamentally about transforming society societal structures, relationships, identities towards social justice. So that was kind of where I had my baby steps as a researcher. And when I start started doing the Remedy Project in particular, and we were, we were really seeking to do Indigenous research um, in different ways. And we had a, have a really diverse team. We've got different artists, got visual artists, designers, musicians, songwriters, musicologists, social workers, uh, psychologists, community musicians, um, creative industries um, and political economy of um, culture, scholars. You know, we've got a real range of people. So we were really pushing the boundaries. But I, I remember saying to someone really early on, I think I'm spending about 80% of my time on ethics in this research project, which was really an interesting insight. And so... I wanted to bring in these kinds of elements into the discussion today. And as you can see on the screen, I've kind of mapped out a journey of all of the different research approaches that I've adopted since my baby steps, working in transformative ethics as a social practice and moral practice, um, right round to, you know, thinking about research as transformative research building on and drawing in all of these different things so if you want to think about this slide and this diagram it's almost like 
you could follow, you could draw in some of these um, resources to help understand what's fed into what we are now calling researchers healing. But it also might be a bit of a, a reading list for those of you who want to look at, you know, how how research can be this deeply nourishing and deeply transformative practice, a moral practice around healing, which I'm going to expand on a bit more through the presentation today. As I went on and as, you know, I've worked in universities as a researcher and a teacher for quite a while now, also worked in government and not-for-profits um, in Australia and overseas, but different things started to build on that foundation in transformative ethics as a really active thing geared towards social justice. Things like sensory ethnography, um, sense-bound research, being embodied researcher rather re researchers rather than just operating from an intellectual space. And then that also flipped into sense-bound songwriting and trauma-informed songwriting as we went along as well. A lot of connections with arts and health disciplines, anti-colonial rights-led research also have made a big impression on me and my approaches, um, particularly teaching and working from a social work perspective when, I, when I've been working at Griffith for big amounts of time from within a social work school. Um, but yeah, as as I um, found out more about my own heritages in the Indigenous sides of my family, the First Nation side, really reconnecting to Indigenous cultural ways of being and knowing and bringing that in really firmly um, through research and research also being a site where many people in universities, many First Nations researchers, students and teachers are able to reconnect with culture and community in ways they might not have even been able to do due to policies of the past. So this is just a bit of a, a taste of all of the things that I think have kind of led into where we are now. And there's one paradigm of research that has come forward really strongly probably over the last 10 to 15 years, which Donna Mertens calls transformative research. And out of everything that I've been reading lately, um, this transformative paradigm seems to sit really nicely as a bit of a bed for what I'm referring to as research as healing. So I just wanted to do, give a little introduction to this for people who aren't familiar with it yet. And then I'll layer on what I think we're, we're adding when we talk about research as healing. So Donna Mertens, um, like other, you know, like other researchers and research theorists in the past, in particular Indigenous research theorists, talks about the need for research to, again, as I said, with transformative ethics, contribute to broader social change that leads to social justice. So for many people in the room, this is not going to be a new idea. Um, Donna Mertens talks about, you know, in research needing to recognise the diverse realities of the political lives that we lead and the diversity in our experiences of reality. And she talks in particular about non-dominant and privileged realities and lives and coming to know those and understand them through different processes of research. And interestingly, in transformative research, she talks about mixed methods, approaches and I often don't see this a lot. So I was trained as a, a health researcher predominantly and a social science researcher. And over time, I've brought in my musicianship, so my songwriting and singing um, into sit beside. And sometimes um, sometimes it gets subjugated. Sometimes it, it comes to the fore in, in relation to my social science research training as well. But I just thought it was really interesting that with that critical and Indigenous um, and non-dominant knowledges perspective that Mertens also tries to bring in both quantitative and qualitative methodologies, so mixed methodologies. And the one thing that really hooked me and got me thinking this can help underpin what we mean by researchers healing is when she starts to talk about the ultimate aims of our research is in reshape, reshaping realities from the personal level to the societal. So we're transforming individuals through to the big structures. And 
but also this really important point that she kind of also almost makes in an offhand way that we're transforming the researchers as much as people who are outside the research. So there's still that sort of assumed division between people who are researchers and those who are the researched in some of that work. But I just want to sort of let people know about that That's and then add on some stuff. So when Mertens talks about transformative research, he really encourages people to pair it with non-dominant knowledges, you know, to, to work from the space of altern completely alternative ways of understanding, knowing, being, seeing, feeling in the world and, and letting those knowledges come forward in ways that are potentially transformative um, inside and outside those communities. So when I think about what she was talking about in terms of a research paradigm, in terms of transformative research, when we want to layer on, like my research is coming from an Indigenous and creative or arts health lens um we need to add some stuff to what donna mertens was saying and she really you know sort of welcomes that and suggests that so for example in this diagram you can see i think when we add an indigenous lens and there might be other lenses that people in this room um, and people watching the recording will be adding um, and when we add a lens on research as being transformative in a way that's specifically about healing and recovery and restoration, um, we move into some new added areas um, on top of what Donna Mertens is saying. So we move into a space where we're recognising and valuing the human and the non-human and really looking at agency diversity, also recognising the effects of trauma, historical and intergenerational in, our, in us and in the, the spaces um, that we're working and the people with whom we're working. But also, really importantly, this notion of sovereignty, which I'm going to talk a bit more about. And instead of just talking about research as a process where we come to know from an Indigenous and healing perspective too, I think we're also reconnecting with this idea of what we already know and remembering different ways of being from the past that, have, that might have been lost or devalued of listening deeply, of feeling and sensing. So it's just adding on those extra layers of, of activity and awareness um, in our research practice. And when we talk about mixed methods, um, when we talk about research as healing and specifically bringing in an Indigenous lens again, we have to add cultural and creative research approaches, techniques, processes, skills, strengths, sensibilities to that mix. It's not just what we might call quantitative and qualitative. It's bringing in the cultural and creative methodologies as well. And then how do we integrate all of that together in respectful ways that are going to lead us toward this positive transformation and healing of self and society? Also, the importance of slow scholarship. Um, there's some amazing stuff written about slow scholarship. It's wonderful to talk about, sometimes really hard to do, um, but it, I think um, in, in the most important parts of the Remedy Project, it's also been a feature, particularly when we're talking about co-creating data in communities and with communities. And then in terms of... Um, transformation um, we're really talking about some specific lenses on that like recovery like re restoration and restorative justice and co-creating new realities new fabrics for the future so it's not just about like um, in first nations communities and healing we often talk about recovery restoration remembering you know, bringing old ways into the new but it's also about this, in healing, it's also a creative process about creating a new future together. So I think, again, at the personal and the shared level, these are the kinds of things that I'm seeing can be overlaid on, on our understanding of what research is and does um, from a healing lens. So I want to quickly touch on this idea of, of sovereignty 
research sovereignty in particular as a foundational understanding. And one of my heroes in this area is Maggie Walter, a First Nations academic working um, from Tasmania, so done some incredible work, but also um, Ray Lovett and the My Kauai study team, all the work they've done around data sovereignty, which is, you know, it, it really started from recognising there's so much data about First Nations communities held in big government organisations that we can't get hold of for our own purposes. And it, the data sovereignty movement um, is really about make, making all research data accessible to communities for their own self-determination and their own decision making. And when we've been working with Children's Ground in Central Australia in particular, our thinking in the Remedy Project has expanded and expanded. And really what our partners at, at Children's Ground are demanding in the most awesome way is not just data sovereignty, but overall research sovereignty. And so when we're thinking about research as healing and we need to recognise the severe damage from the past, there is there are wounds that need healing in terms of just the relationship between academic university-based researchers and communities and that are the most over-researched communities in the world. So, and, and the mistrust, the, the rational mistrust, the reasonable and justified scepticism and sometimes hostility that members of our communities are going to have, um, it, you know, research can, on its own can be a dirty word and, and that is fully justified. So I think part of understanding research as healing in a First Nations context must include discussions about research sovereignty. And, um, you know, I really... I remember one conversation I had with one of our community research leaders in Mbantua, Alice Springs in particular, Amanda Gori, an amazing Arunda research leader. And I was saying, you know, about the, I feel like this tension, you know, and it was sort of a bit of researcher hand-wringing stuff, the conversation, but we were having a really good debrief. And I said, you know, I'm worried about over-research, like are people going to get benefit out of this? Do you feel benefit from being involved? so far and Amanda said in the 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 gentlest way I think your understanding of research is out of date you know like I think that the the process that we went through the EOI um, the governance group agreeing and telling you what we want from this um, us working together at every step um, you know community researchers guiding the research, being involved in it from start to finish. You know, this is about our communities getting the information that we need to do the work that we want to do, you know. So it was that that really humble position of visiting researchers or outside researchers um, in the face of incredible strength and governance and community leadership there. So I would say anyone who wants to have a look at Children's Ground, they've got an amazing research framework that really puts into action concepts like research sovereignty, um, all of the important elements of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as well, because this is about rights-based research as well. So I want to just, you know, I'm, I'm drawing, like I'm using big brushes here, um, but I think these are incredibly important things to have bubbling up top of mind, top of heart, all the time when we're talking about healing in research, um, through research with First Nations people and communities. So to start to draw together the threads a bit um, of what I've shared, so the quick, you know, rapid cooks tour I've given, I wanted to share a diagram that a member of the research team, the Remedy research team, Ray Cooper, who's a Waramai visual researcher and designer, came up with. And in the background, you'll also see our commissioned artwork for the Remedy project by Glenn Barry um, called Syncopation Meets Synesthesia, I See Music. But this diagram here summarises a literature review that I did um, to help guide guide our analysis and interpretation of all of our yarn data in the Remedy Project about the role of music in people's lives, in their health and well-being, and as a form of cultural action. 
So this sort of summarises First Nations written down knowledge that we could find about what is healing from a First Nations perspective. And you'll see there, like particularly toward the top of the diagram, the stuff that I've been saying about sovereignty and agency is really important there when we talk about self-determination, transcending, transforming. Um, but there's also all these other elements that came through from the, the knowledge that was written down and that we sort of synthesized into this diagram. And you can see there elements like ceremony, like creating, rebuilding, storytelling, remembering, mourning. And um, organizations and leaders like Ani Judy Atkinson and Carly Atkinson at We Ali really bring in really practical um, knowledges around things like feeling the feelings and finding our stories in response to the effects of profound um, and ongoing intergenerational and historical trauma in First Nations settings. So this is, again, specific to First Nations people, but not limited in its applicability only to our communities. Um, you'll see at the bottom there things around well well-being and really holistic conceptions of well-being from the community to country, culture, identity, spirit, dreaming, family, self, universe. And there's some incredible literature that's coming out now about the, the natural environment as one of the biggest determinants of all of our health and well-being. Um, also, healing as involving reconnection, um, emotional reconnection, spiritual reconnection, physical community and family. And so... As I'm going through this and as you're looking at it, I just want to invite everyone like to come from your own perspective, to sit in your own chair and from your own lens and just look at that and think about your own research practice. Um, we've also got calming and grounding, safety and diversity. So if you were thinking about whatever it may be, whatever topics, whatever processes, whatever disciplines you're coming to, um, this this talk today as a researcher, how might these kinds of processes, concepts, practices link into what you're doing as a researcher? And while you're doing that, I just want to focus our attention in a little bit again and ground us again um, with, I think, one of my really enduring favourite definitions and descriptions of what healing is from Helen Milroy, who's an Aboriginal psychiatrist who's done so much in the, the area of social, emotional wellbeing and healing. So as you're looking at the diagram, I'm just going to read this through and invite you, if you'd like to, to keep your eyes open or even shut them or move, whatever you'd like to do. But this is Helen Milroy's description of what healing is, and I absolutely love it, and I think it's a great resource for us to think about when we're thinking about our effects and our journeys as researchers. So here we go. Healing is part of life and continues through death and into life again. It, incur it occurs throughout a person's life journey as well as across generations. It can be experienced in many forms, such as mending a wound or recovery from illness. Mostly, however, it is about renewal, leaving behind those things that have wounded us and caused us pain moving forward in our journey with hope for the future, with renewed energy, strength and enthusiasm for life. Healing gives us back to ourselves, not to hide or fight anymore, but to sit still, calm our minds, listen to the universe and allow our spirits to dance on the wind. It lets us enjoy the sunshine and be bathed by the golden glow of the moon as we drift into our dream time. Healing ultimately gives us back to our country to stand once again in our rightful place, eternal and generational. Healing is not just about recovering what has been lost or repairing what has been broken. It is about embracing our life force to create a new and vibrant fabric that keeps us grounded and connected, wraps us in warmth and love and gives the joy of seeing what we have created. Healing keeps us strong and gentle at the same time. It gives us balance and harmony, a place of triumph and sanctuary forevermore. And 
every time I read that and I hear it, I think, wow, you know, what if our journeys as researchers could help us to experience that ourselves? So that coming back to ourselves, not having to hide or fight anymore. But also what if the effects of our research could have that more that flow on effect more generally in our communities, our societies, our families. So you can see there that the healing impulse and approach to research is fundamentally transformative, but also restorative. And I think that if you think back to that circle and foundings, and I showed you all the different parts that have led me to be where I am now, I feel more at home and more grounded now in my role as a researcher and my approaches than I ever have. And so there's that really intimate healing of the researcher that can happen over time as we find our place. So I think um, now I'll just start to pivot into how some of this comes into practice and I'll give some examples from my own work. And when we finish off the presentation and we all start to yarn in breakout groups, I'd love to, you to think about and maybe share how healing might feature in your own research work or how it might in future if you don't feel it's been there yet. But Arnie Judy Atkinson, Carly Atkinson and all the team of facilitators that we really, really draw on in their healing work, um, Indigenous cultural healing practices, and they've summarised what they think those are here. And I looked at this and I've been, you know, I'm in training. I'm a P-plater facilitator in the healing work we Lee does. And it's absolutely underpinning so many shifts across my career, my whole life, the work that I'm talking about today. But when I look at this, I think, you know, in the Remedy Project in particular, we've just happened to, um, through the influence of all the different people involved in the settings that are supporting us, being able to do almost all of these and to bring these healing practices into our research project and our teamwork. Um, I guess the only one that's here that we haven't ventured into is theatre and drama, but I think all of the others are present in our work. So I just really want to put that there and also like just invite everyone to snapshot that in your mind because in the field of arts health in particular um, or anywhere where creative arts um, and creativity meets um, well-being practices, healing practices, health, you know, health promotion, these are incredibly powerful techniques that we can bring in to really overtly transform research processes so they're not a dirty word or a disabling or a harming practice anymore, but the, the innate, the intrinsic processes we use in, here, in research can help to heal those wounds and that damage from the past that we might have experienced that or that we might have inflicted wittingly or unwittingly or others might have inflicted wittingly or unwittingly on communities. So just put a little um, note for people around that. And because I work in arts health and I know some people in the session today and some people who might watch the recording are working in arts health as well and also, you know, creative practice-led researchers, um, I just wanted to like sort of imagine this circle of, of all the work that we're doing, you know, like, and there's a big circle. Like I imagine we're all even sitting around campfire. There's a big, you know, extended circle that goes beyond what's on the screen here that might include, um, you know, physical research into physical health, or, you know, it might include humanities and history or, you know, biology, but all sorts of other kind of research. But I just see this little part of the circle here and all of the things that are, are sitting beside, all of the, the practices that are sitting beside and influencing what I'm talking about when I say research is healing. And one that I haven't really mentioned um, overtly yet is definitely trauma-sensitive research. And through being trained as a healing um, facilitator and doing uh, more research in other projects around the potential for um, you know, creative activities like group songwriting to be a healing um, experience. 
we've really gone into what does it mean to work in a trauma sensitive way and I think that is a must have that element of knowledge and practice and ways of being together um, trauma sensitivity is is a must have when we're talking about research as healing because we're just acknowledging that trauma is so common and it's so pervasive in us and in others um, that having those sensibilities there are really important. Okay, so um, we're coming up to some remedy stories. So what I'd like to now do is just um, share with you. So we've got this emerging model here of First Nations knowledge that's, that's been written down about what healing is and what it involves. And we've mapped that, or I've mapped that onto some examples from the Remedy Project. And again, this is early days of trying to write down and share what we've actually been doing in this project in ways that might be useful for other projects or might resonate with other researchers in other areas. But you can see here in the table, um, we've got stacks of examples. So this idea of ceremony in research is not new. Um, Sean Wilson has written a beautiful book about it. But for us, it, the, the key things have been about the importance of pre preparing for the yarns that we're doing and, and then and then the follow-up, like the clean-up after the ceremony of yarning together, so debriefing yarns and events, and also taking time away, so regular time away as a team to reconnect and, and have retreats. The importance of well-being, um, of self-care in research, particularly in topic areas and environments that can be quite harsh or challenging, um, potentially re-traumatising for people, everyone involved in the research. So self-care, communities of care, learning teams, um, but also, you know, this is something that the Creative Arts Research Institute and Griffith is doing quite well, I think that environmental justice aspect of research, you know, and key people at Griffith have been really challenging researchers to care for country and to have environmental responsibility in everything we're doing. Um, I won't go through all of these, but um, I just want to really focus in on the element of healing as research around storytelling. So this is where I think creative practitioners, arts, health researchers, interdisciplinary teams can really extend the potential of research. Um, storytelling can happen in research through all creative arts and does and design methods. Um, it's, a, it's a real key strength of our approaches. Um, but also if we bring in the Indigenous healing approaches, the approaches, it's really important. And also, you know, Tanya Dreyer and other people's work on the politics of listening really emphasises this as well. There should be no storytelling without attention to deep listening. And again, I think that fits really well within that transformative research paradigm. Um, applied listening might be another way. So what are we doing as researchers to ensure that deep listening occurs and applied listening in response? Um, I think that processes of calming and grounding ourselves, I'm just skipping down the table a little bit, have been central as well in the way that we've conducted yarns. And in the Remedy Project, people in the team and others might be sick of me saying this, but I've never had yarns in a research context like I've had in the Remedy Project. And we, we've sort of sat down together with community research associates and team members and gone, what is it that's actually worked? And I think it's all the elements that I've talked about already today. Um, but in particular, that me as a person holding space for a yarn with another person to invite their stories to be contributed to the project, you know, it is that grounding myself, listening to what's happening for me, a practice of mindfulness, slowing down, breathing, connecting to country very deliberately. Um, and then once I've calmed myself as that research facilitator, holding out that beautiful open space, that container um, for someone else to come in and join me and also hopefully experience that, um, that feeling of relaxation, of connection. And it moves from being, um, you know, sort of an extractive process 
to what can be, you know, at its best, a deeply spiritual encounter. So where, you know, you, you're yarning with someone and that feeling that time slows down or that you, you really are feeling that wind on your cheeks as you're sitting there in awe of the story that's being shared with you. And I think if we cultivate and train ourselves and familiarise ourselves and come home to that, that connection to country, that connection to self, the calming and grounding, self-care, all of these Indigenous protocols and ways of working and we're upholding the political rights, self-determination, sovereignty that's so essential to repair the harms of the past, then we have a real chance of having these incredibly transformative experiences within a project and then creating beautiful, impactful data that can then be used for wherever we're hoping to go to collectively um, the why of what we're doing, the research. So the destinations, I think that through adopting, you know, almost just by a confluence of events, this approach to research that we're calling research as healing, um, we've a- achieved great depth, greater depth than I've ever experienced before in terms of the, the yarn data that's been co-created, but also the artefacts that are emerging. So new models for understanding health determinants, visual artworks, designs, Ray Cooper completely shook up the informed, ethics informed consent um, world and paradigms by doing a yarn through, beautifully designed yarn through ethics map that was trauma informed as well. So things like this, and all of this is available on our website if anyone wants to check it out. But upholding and always coming back to those human rights, um, these ideas of research sovereignty, so really pushing outward on that. It's not about inclusion. It's not about consultation. This is sovereignty, you know, and I'm really behind Chelsea Watergo when she says, um, tongue-in-cheek, let's break up with equity. We're going for sovereignty, you know. Healing and that 3D transformative impact that Donna Mertens talked about and that I talked about in terms of it's healing researchers, you know, and and then through that we've sort of burnt our own wood and we become we, we become ourselves a safer place for others to engage with and a safer place for ourselves, you know, as part of maintaining our long-term well-being and sustainability as researchers. And and how does this affect institutions? Um, I love Richard Schwartz's work on healing trauma. And he, he does, he's sort of one of the main authors behind this internal family systems healing approach to trauma. And he's the guy who said that, you know, when we're little ones, we have these things that happen in our lives and little parts of us um, develop really effective ways of responding to and keeping keep those outside things and keeping us safe. And he says that, um, you know, part of healing is just becoming aware of those things that we develop for the coping mechanisms from the past and and letting those those little ones that are still somewhere inside us relax that they don't have to be on high alert anymore we're actually okay and he he made this quote this this comment that once there is critical mass of self-healing energy in a system so he's talking about within one being within one person the whole system begins to transform so that, that sort of in, in a system of people responding to, to trauma, once that, that, that healing happens within a person to a certain level, that the whole self gets to heal. And I think that that's similar within teams. I think that that's similar within institutions. And it also it leads me to sort of come back to another project very briefly, um, a lower Institute C grant project where we were looking at theories of change with Aunty Judy, Carly Atkinson, um, Wheelie, all these people who've done training in culturally informed trauma healing approaches over the last 30 years. And, you know, like I've been informed by health determinants models for a long time and public health understandings that you need the macro to shift so that everything underneath it can be influenced in a positive way, that sort of massive sort of e- ecological understanding that the big stuff really shapes the, the smaller stuff underneath it. But through yarning to all of these amazing people across the nation and then to Aunty Judy as well, 
you know, we came back to this a much more humble, a much more patient um, sort of understanding of change, institutional and social change, where it's this planting the seed. So if we think about as Ash Dargan has described, you know, all of the trauma and all of the hurt that has developed over time, over generations, as this massive storm cloud brewing. We can think about um, our work as healing-based researchers or researchers promoting transformation as helping to, in return, slowly diffuse that massive cloud of hurt and trauma and dysfunction. Um, through increments and through generations. So across generations, we're healing what is built up across generations, if that makes sense. So instead of this massive, let's run to the top and transform the macro only, I think that's still an important perspective. In the work that we're doing now, we're looking at the small steps, the planting the seed that grows the beautiful tree for the future generations to sit under and benefit from. So unwinding of harms and hurts through our research practice and our creative practice. So that was a whirlwind tour and a lot of talking. Um, but just before we do open up for some yarns in the breakout groups, everyone, I wanted to um, share with you some more music. So I said in our Remedy Project, we've got a policy no talk without music. Um, this is a piece that was... Um, co-written and performed by Glenn Barry and I with Aunt Marianne Wobke and Phil Graham. And it was um, composed for Marianne's work on perinatal dreaming. And it's just a sneak preview of a small snippet of the soundscape for that work. And so I just invite everyone to let everything that I've just said sort of move into the background or find its place, have a few deep breaths, and let's just reconnect with whatever's going on and reconnect with country um, as a way to finish off the presentation component. Here we go. Deadly. Everyone, I can see all your names now. So thanks again for joining. Um, what we're going to do now is set up some breakout rooms because I'd really love for you to be able to just debrief and share any thoughts, feelings, stories that came up for you as we went through the presentation then. And I'd also love for people to just introduce themselves because um, normally if we were all sitting together, we would know who we were sitting with. Um, so I'm going to put everyone into some breakout rooms. I'm going to be randomly chucked into one with you as well. So we're just going to do that for, say, 10 minutes or so and then come back to the big group. And I'll be inviting everyone um, to share something in the chat and some of the people or one person maybe from each group just to share back what were the features of the discussion you have in the breakout rooms. So what we might do is go breakout for 10 minutes 10 minutes or so so we'll have fairly small groups and then we're coming back into the big group just to finish off in big circle so please take a couple of deep breaths have a stretch and um, get ready to introduce yourself share what you're thinking and feeling after the presentation and any very brief stories you might have about your experiences of healing in a research context that came up for you okay welcome welcome Hope everyone had some good debriefs and yarns. Um, 
So now I'd really like to stop talking and just hand it over to all of you. We've got about roughly 20 minutes left in our session. Um, we're still being recorded. I'll just let everyone know. Um, so, yeah, I invite everyone to just share anything that you like in the chat, but also would really love to hear from maybe at least one person from each of the breakout rooms with their voices, if that feels comfortable. And in case I forget, I also just really, really want to thank and acknowledge Louise Johnson at CARI, Creative Arts Research Institute, and the magical fairy Vanessa Tomlinson for everything that they do um, for all of us, but particularly the Remedy Project. We love you and we appreciate you and we thank you. Um, so, yep, over and out, over to all of you. Um, thoughts, stories, images, poems, rants, questions, please go for it. I'll open it up to whoever would like to go first. Please just open your mic and talk or let me know. Oh, Glenn's got something awesome. No talk without music. Transform. Yeah, beautiful. You're in, yeah. Thank you. Can we can we get a photo of that? No. <laughs> we won't sell it. <laughs> All right. Who would like to share anything? Okay. Annika. Annika, is that the right name? The right pronunciation? You tell us. Annika. Hello, um, I'm Anique. I'm here on in uh, Brunswick Heads on uh, Arakwal and Bunchalung country, northern New South Wales, Northern Rivers. Um, firstly, thank you so much, uh, Naomi and Glenn and Brigitte and Kari. It, it's been a very moving um, seminar for me. Uh, it's coincided with the opening of an exhibition for a research project, uh, Living Water Visits. At streams of reconnection, which has been evolving very slowly over the last two or three years and has been interrupted by COVID lockdowns and um, floods. And the uh, in my breakout room with Sunny, which was great, um, that recognition of finding language for the sort of research that we are doing and the recognition of the value of the word healing in an academic circle and what you've just been talking about has been really helpful. Uh, the diagram and that centrality um, for transformation, for the ethics, but seeing it in a different way. Um, the I feel what I'm doing when I looked at that diagram, I was feeling really so in connection with many of the points and realizing where my weaknesses were and where I'm beginning and where I'm maybe further along. And that was extremely helpful for me in, in, in both as a researcher, but as also as an artist, sorry, I'm a visual artist, didn't explain that, um, with performative uh, participatory projects with um, human and warm human and companion thinking is another um, methodology that's come through Kari um, and Dr. Jodie Rottle and Hannah Reardon Smith. Um, so I'm finding, sorry, I'm, ran I'm rambling a little bit, I feel, <laughs> but I just wanted to express the essence of uh, the importance of what you're doing and how I'm not Indigenous and it spreads to my, my work very as well and how I can um, ground myself and my work more in this as well so thank you end of ramble <laughs> thank you Anique nothing ramblish about that that was gorgeous thank you hey would anyone else like to open up a mic Heather you would let you like to share our, <laughs> our sharing <laughs> You've been voluntold, Heather. <laughs> no, we, we, the two of us uh, talked about our, our experiences um, as musicians. Um, personally, I, well, I'm, I'm doing my research now in, in the conservatorium 
uh, on community choirs for marginalized individuals. And I thought that my research can be not only healing for them, but healing for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, my context is I've been working in the university as, as a teacher, as an administrator, and now I'm shifting to being a student. And for me, that's a healing process as well. And I felt that my research work would also bring healing to the young people I'll be working with when I do my, my engagement with them. And hopefully I'll do more than just researching, just by giving them perhaps voice workshops or things that I can do and have fun in the process, not just a simple, um, you know, what this thing of the usual default work of data gathering and interviewing, but it's more like um, uh, a fellowship, so to speak, in, wow. in, in, in like building connections and friendships in, in the process of researching. And um, and I'd like Heather also show, shared how her uh, poetry writing has also helped her heal in the, in 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 her own. Heather, maybe you can share about your. <laughs> um, I think yeah. Uh, just listening to Maria as she was talking about her um her work and her research, it uh, we connected on those um, similar things in how. Um, I mean, poetry can be part of a musical um, type of um, connecting com um, communities and used in communities. So we, um, that was something we both connected on, um, how it can empower. Um, I, I don't like the word empower, I think, um, because it seems to be um, something that, you know, if I think it's just that stepping back and allowing people to 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 bring forth and to um to use um and to have that type of um you know way of um being with people to um allow their stories and their through music and through um through the arts I uh yeah we we were sort of just I I, I wanted to just say um it's I'm here. I'm not. I'm not a Griffiths um, student, but I'm from um, a, an arts-based. Um, I do arts-based research as a student at the moment, and um, I've been seeking out um, something like this. And I was so excited to be part to hear um, about this research as healing and and just running with um, sovereignty as being um foundational to to where um to you know for me in my in my um heart and I'm yeah I'm just uh, you know it's given me a lot to um to uh follow up and to continue seeking and searching to how it can relate to um the research I'm, I'm doing mine on um areas of grief and how grief is so in interconnected with um so many things um non-human human non-human non and um across um across time and it's not linear you know there's lots of things and um yeah but just back to the arts and how um the singing uh and the music can really um speak into that yeah so wonderful thank <laughs> you <laughs> Okay, um, we still have time. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, if anyone from the other groups who hasn't shared yet would like to share back in, report back, what did you find on your journey together? Um. Uh, Anik already spoke for uh, our, my, our group, but as because it was the time was very short <laughs> and something just sort of came up to, in, to my mind that felt very important for me. Um, and that's about 
healing oneself as a researcher through the research. Mm. And I I think I think that's quite a profound sort of shift. Mm. You know, and and it, as yeah, and, and it kind of it and it I think it's um like I think because I'm writing my PhD thesis right now and I, I'm trying to think about ways that I can actually in a practical way like talk about it talk about that you know in the thesis <laughs> if there would be you know I mean I don't know if you would have any advice on that mm -hmm. um, yeah I mean in in my work I am you know I I am collaborating with other uh musicians to write together, to perform the work together and on all that and based on, you know, true stories of our true family stories about motherhood and, you know, migration and all that. And so I am quite involved, but uh yeah, I I wonder if you had any advice on sort of how to go about writing about this, you know, healing process or healing that healing journey of the researcher mm. I think there's a lot of ways Sunny and thank you for sharing that um so important and I think a lot of people put it into a prologue and they tell the extended story and it situates you as a researcher beautifully as well um and it lets the person get to know you like that the person who's going to be reading it or receiving it um I personally do a lot of my own healing and self-care through my creative practice, which may or may not ever actually get to a public forum. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, you know. So, And sometimes it's because I'm a songwriter, it's sitting there after I've done a massive fieldwork trip and held it all together for everyone else and I come home and I start to sing and the tears come gushing out and as I, as the words come you know, for the lyrics, you know, I suddenly have that thing, this, I was trying to bring together other people's stories, but it's my story and it's our story and, you know, you know, but that's just how I let things out. And it's actually one of our findings in the Remedy Project, you know, surprise, surprise, people use music to release emotion. And it's a huge part of Indigenous grieving process is to let the voice out, let the emotion out on breath, on voice. Um, so for me, it's there's a private element behind the curtain yeah. um, of my own healing and then there might be a public element of situating ourselves. And th I think that's from many different methodological perspectives that's valuable and many different cultural perspectives that's valuable. So from a social science perspective, you know, I'm thinking of nursing researchers, you know, just using your subjectivity transparently as well. Um, letting it be a resource rather than a bias um, but being aware of it and having colleagues that you can debrief with who will say is that about that or is that about that you know when they feel that the stories might be um, invisibly merging if that's a way to say it um, is that useful Sunny? Yeah, 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 very useful. Definitely one to keep talking about with your supervisors. But yeah, I think prologues are awesome. Yeah. So grounding. Yep. Thank you. All righty, we've got maybe time. I hate not hearing from people who want to talk. Um, like I don't like to shut the lid on something that wants to come out. Does anyone want to say anything before we finish off? Lynette, Ali, Kandinsky, Katrina, Uncle Glenn. Renata and I were in a room together. So Renata was sort of put on the spot straight away. <laughs> she had to talk to me and tell me what she thought. Um, but we had a great yarn. But we, we I won't the... say much, Naomi, but I'll just say thank you. It's always great to hear from you, always. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Katrina. And Katrina's a social work researcher, everyone, who's very creative. And so if you're looking for collaborators, she's awesome. Glenn? Um, yeah, I think for me, the the graphs that we talk about 
um, the thing came up for me was like an enneagram, the idea of one thing was connected to another thing. It's not separated or siloed out. It wasn't just the one thing that we're looking at, sort of thing. But in in continuity and in in context too. So one thing feeds another, and I think come back to Sunny's question of how do we use it? And you you're a great example of that yourself. Of, of your own articulation of how much you've changed and changing past tense, present tense, future tense in this space. And I think for me, the process is is the search, but then the research is about articulating and sharing that, that story, that yarn. And how do we do that? And there's contextual stuff for that, there's time associated with that, there's relationships associated with that of how deep, how far, you know, how wide, how much weight that we carry or how much weight that we let go of. Um, and so, look, this is an interesting modelling, I think. This is the thing I really wanted to bring attention is if we can't recognise it, we can't do it. And so we're recognising something in this. We might not understand it, but our bodies, our embodiment is actually going... Yeah, yes, yes, pick me, pick me, pick me. And then the brain, instead of trying to do it the other way around, try to understand the facts, and then go, right, I've got X, Y, and Z in line, and I'm going to do it. And in our breakout room, we talk, I talked about, what if we're all healed? What then? What, 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 that, is that the ultimate goal? And if we, if, if we got there, what would we, we do? It's just a hypothetical. Maybe we already are healed. I don't know. <laughs> we made it the we made it to here. So it's, maybe we are. Yeah. yeah, awesome, Uncle Glenn. Thank you. And it sort of reminds me about what Ash Dargan was saying in the podcast we released this week, him and Auntie Judy. Um, you know, like culture and cultural practices wasn't meant for healing, but we're using it for healing because we're we're correcting. We're reconnecting, you know, um, we're restoring. But at a certain point, if we're practicing culture day to day, that's the maintenance and we kind of like we'll be well. That that was the sort of the different take that he put forward. Really, really amazing. Like really. But okay, um, we're just finishing off and Ali's got a brand new granny. You can see her doing granny work there. Um Lovely to see the baby. Um, but just, yeah, just to finish, I'll just invite everyone, just want to thank everyone for coming. Thank everyone who contributed, um, acknowledge the Broader Remedy Project team and all of our supporters. Um, we will be writing this up, but feel free, this will be record. this is recorded and we will put it online. Feel free to come back to it as is useful. Uh, but yeah, we'll be writing it up and we actually want to, Carly Atkinson and I are talking about we'd really love to write this up as a book so a book on researchers healing um so send me your good wishes and you know your breath to push us forward on that aim that will be a slower process but um thank you all would love to stay in touch and hear more stories as you're going along um and I just invite everyone to check out on the chat if that's okay how are you feeling now is there anything that you wanted to say that you haven't been able to say yet? Um, so that's it. Over and out. Thank you, good people, and have a wonderful afternoon.